and a mighty God that we serve, amen. And he is here with us and he is for us, amen. And if he is for us, who can be against us, amen. You guys, we're going to welcome you guys this morning to VWO in Denton, Texas. Just amazing seeing all the beautiful people here, all the powerful testimonies that we have, amen. It's amazing just sitting there thinking and praising about what God has done in our lives, amen. And he's not done yet, amen. He got so much more for us, amen. Let's continue to press through, amen. God's word says out of John 16, 33 says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, amen. That's the God that we serve, the one that already overcame the world, amen. Let's be excited today. Let's be happy today of all the powerful testimonies that he has done, amen. I'll give you mine again. I'll continue to give it, amen. Not to glorify the world, but to glorify God. I was a, a meth addict for 15 years of my life, nine years sober, amen. I give you all the glory for that, amen. All the glory for that, amen. It is by his grace and his mercy that I'm standing here today praising and worshiping him because I could not ever imagine that in my life. I could not ever imagine that I'd be standing in front of a pulpit praising his name, amen. My family, my kids, my in-laws are here. Just serving God together, amen. I give him all the praise and glory for that. And he got sad for you too, amen. Continue to press through, amen, and believe that God has a miracle for you. We're going to have a, a powerful day today in, in, in the Lord. We've got people getting baptized today, making a step, a leap of faith, amen. That's amazing what God is doing, amen. Does anybody have a need in this place? Let's pray for that need and pray for this service, amen. Let's pray together. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, Father, thanking you, Father, for allowing us to be here this morning in your presence, Father God. And God, we pray that you would answer every need that's in this place, Father. God, that nobody will go out of this place, or God, not knowing you, Father God. And when they walk through these doors, that they will feel your presence upon them, Father God, because we serve you and only you, Father. And God, we thank you for all that you're about to do through this place this morning, Father God. We pray for your mighty move and your mighty anointing upon Pastor's word this morning, Father. God, we praise you and we glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And we all said, amen. Amen, amen. Now is the time to where we get to give into the kingdom of God, amen? Amen. How many of us know that money's spiritual? Amen. All throughout the Word of God, man, God always gives examples of this uh, about, about money being spiritual, man. But I just wanted to uh, key in on one specific uh, passage in the Bible where it talked about how Judas had betrayed Jesus for money, amen? And in doing so, he ended up hanging himself because he tried to find satisfaction in something that he couldn't get that satisfaction in, amen? The Bible says that to spread the gospel to all creation all throughout the world. Now, physically, we may not be able to do that, but our tithes and our offerings and our finances will be able to do so. For example, we have churches in the Czech Republic. We have churches in Costa Rica, where Pastor Blake is at right now. Uh, we have churches in the Congo, and we have churches all throughout the Metroplex. So with our finances, yes, although physically we're not there, but we're doing it by helping pastors be able to spread the good news, being the hands and feet of Jesus in these regions. Amen. Uh, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. It goes back to that example what Judas had done with uh, portraying Jesus on the cross. All right? 
And I want to read a quote. It says, money can buy a bed, but not sleep. Money can buy a wedding ring, but not love. Money can buy a clock, but not time. Money can buy an education, <laughs> but not wisdom. Money can buy jewelry, but not beauty. Money can buy insurance, but not safety. Money can buy a crucifix, but not a savior. Amen. Let's not let that be us, church. Let's continue to give with a giving heart, knowing that the gospel is being spread throughout the whole world. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity, Lord God, of just being able to sow into the kingdom of God. Your word says, neither rust nor moth can enter in, Heavenly Father, with our investment into the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the jobs that you give us for us to provide, Lord Jesus, and be able to give into the kingdom of God and everything that we do, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you, for it is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. and I have some exciting announcements for you. Today is Baptism Sunday, and we'd love for you to join us after second service to celebrate everyone getting baptized and taking that next step in their walk with Christ. Our church is definitely growing, but our prayer is always for it to grow more. We want to reach people on all platforms in order to get the gospel out to as many as we can. Social media allows us to get creative in reaching out to the community. People are able to tune into our services and worship with us through our YouTube channel. While Facebook and Instagram allow everyone to stay in the loop on what's going on here at VWO Den. We also want to remind you that our website is a great tool to share with people as well to stay up to date on what's going on. Now, everyone take out your phones, take a picture of this next slide, subscribe, like, and follow. We encourage you to share content as you see things pop up, as this will help us reach more souls. Praise God. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. Now, I didn't see a whole lot of people with your phone out taking pictures there. So hopefully you got it. Amen. I can't see without my glasses. And, of course, our screen was off, so I couldn't see it myself. But if you need that information, you can feel free to ask at the, at the sound booth uh, later on today. Or maybe we can post it at the end. But what a wonderful day it's going to be, amen, with uh, so many people being baptized today. It's going to be an awesome opportunity. I see family here today, amen, that are supportive. And uh, I want to ask you a question. Are you awake this morning? Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, God has called me to wake you up if, if you're not awake. Hallelujah. But uh, what a wonder opportun wonderful opportunity it is to minister God's word. Pastor is in Costa Rica this morning ministering in San Jose. He's actually in Paseo Colon. Um, it's our new church that we just planted there with Pastor Jose. Um, and so be lifting him up in prayer, amen, this church there in Paseo Colon. It was wonderful to see the testimonies and the pictures and videos that came through yesterday from, of course, my son Landon. Uh, Pastor took his son-in-law Landon and uh, Jose with him on this missions trip. It's a wonderful opportunity for these guys. But, you know, we got to see the videos. They're out in the streets ministering the gospel, walking through these neighborhoods and and uh, just being an encouragement to Pastor Jose and his wife, him and his family. But, uh, you know, uh, it was good to see also Pastor Carlos and Gloria from the Pavas Church 
they were there with them ministering and uh, God was doing amazing things amen so let's continue to pray for pastor as he's there and uh, you know he he, he would love to, he'd rather be here with us but how many know that when you pastor six churches you have to oversee things and be there and and be an encourager and strengthen and minister the word of God so that we can all be the one family we talk about being amen you know it, we just gave in an offering this morning and and to know that when we give here in this local house the Bible says to bring your tithe into the storehouse is what we did this morning we tithe and we gave our offerings to the Lord right here but that money goes beyond the four walls of the church as as uh, as brother David was saying you know pastors ministering in another country right now amen and people are getting saved and people God is changing their lives and so we get to be a part of that isn't that a wonderful thing to know that while we're sitting here in our comfort in our church we're sitting here in these nice comfortable chairs that somewhere all over the world God is doing something else amen Hallelujah. It doesn't have to just mean our fellowship, but God's doing a lot in a lot of other places. And I'm so thankful for this honest ministry that we have here and thankful for our pastor. Amen. Thankful again for this opportunity to minister the word this morning. How many got your Bibles today? Praise God. We're going to go through the word of God here and I want to minister for just a few moments. You know, I was telling one of my sons <clears throat> just this week, I had a nightmare. I think it was either Wednesday or Thursday of this week. It's the nightmare I always have. And if you've heard me say it before, I get a nightmare every so often, and it's most of the time when I know I'm preaching or when I know that my schedule for preaching is busy or whatever the case is, but the devil will distract me, and the devil will always come at me with a nightmare in the middle of the night. And this week, I was, I was in a conference, and I was, I was standing there, and I, was, I wasn't even on the schedule to preach, and somebody comes up to me and says, hey, you're about to preach in just a second. I'm standing there, and I'm not even dressed up like I should be. To, to, to preach, you know, we wear, we wear suits when we pastor, when we preach, and uh, uh, we either have a jacket on or we have a tie with a, with a shirt. I wasn't even ready. And I was thinking, you know, all the conviction uh, came on me about the scriptures or, or about the discipleship we've had all of our life when you got to be ready in season and out of season. And, and I'm thinking, my goodness, I've dropped the ball. And so I start, I start slithering through the back of this stage, and I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get from here to there. And I got to thinking, I didn't even have a sermon. I don't even have a sermon ready. And I'm thinking, man, how am I going to preach in this conference if I don't have? And, and this is an ongoing nightmare that I get quite a bit, amen. It's, it's a devil torment in my mind. But it also helps me to stay ready at all times. It helps me to be ready. You know, just like, kind of like our fight with, with the devil and our fight with life. You know, you always have to be ready. If you're not ready, the devil will catch you off guard. And he will win the battle if he catches you off guard. If we're not prepared, if we're not ready to do what God's wanting us to do, amen. But anyways, I told my son, I said, you know what? I get this all the time, and I'm not afraid of the devil. You know, sometimes we get afraid of the devil. We get afraid of, of the accomplishment or something we're not able to do, and we kind of wither up like a dog that feels like it's in trouble. We kind of go to the corner a little bit, amen. But see, God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to rise up above the situation, of course, using him as our authority, and rise up and do something powerful for him, amen. How many know we're not here for ourselves? We're not here just to, just to be better or to be great or to do wonderful things in this world, but we are called on this earth. We, are, we have been created very personably. God put his signature on every single one of us to do his will. Amen? And I want to minister for just a few moments on pushing down our enemies. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to look in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 39. It's a little bit long for scripture here, but I'm going to read this. It's going to open us up to what I want to minister on this morning. So if you have your Bibles, follow along. If not, it's on the screen. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because him who subjected in the hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the, from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know not, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the, for the adoption, the redemption of our body. 
For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, all, who are called according to his purpose. For whom he, for, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, uh, these who also called, whom he called, uh, these he also justified, and whom he justified, uh, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers uh, nor things present nor things to come for height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Let's give this service to the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, God. We ask you to be with us today, Lord. Be with me as I minister your word. Use me as an oracle, as a vessel of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I thank you for using uh, people who are just have a heart that, that's willing, Father. I thank you for it, God. Touch our hearts. Touch our minds. Uh, we give you praise for this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I'm telling you, this, this passage of Scripture is pretty awesome. But, you know, I also read in Psalms chapter 44, verse 5, it says, it says, Through you we will push down our enemies. Through your name we will trample those who rise up against us. You know, I got to thinking that, and that's how I titled this message, Pushing Down Our Enemies. Amen? One of the questions I want to start off by asking you this morning is, I want to ask you if you're winning the battle that's going on in your life or are you losing? Are you conquering or are you being conquered in your life? You know, and we need to understand this today that, you know, in our walk with God, even if, you know, in our walk in this life, we're either winning or we're losing. You're either going up or you're going down. You're, 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 you know, I, I love to, to say that we're all just going up all the time, but the truth of the matter is we're going through some difficult times in our life at times. Amen? Am I alone today, or is there other people in this place where you go through trials? You go through some hard times, and, and you know, I'm not asking this condemningly, or I'm not asking you this because I want to be negative this morning, but I'm asking you this to bring into focus the reality that we are engaged in this thing called spiritual warfare. Amen? It's a battle. It's a battle for your life. It's a battle for everything that goes on in your life. Every gift that God has ever given you, there's a battle that's going on right now. And the devil is at work. Uh, he's, he's at work to destroy you. And that's why I ask these questions today. You know, listen, there are powerful spiritual forces that war against you and I as believers today. These are demonic forces that come against us. That's why we bind sorcery. That's why we bind witchcraft. That's why we take authority over, you know, things that go on in our life. Lord, protect me from wicked people today because there's always somebody in this world that is out to get you. <laughs> I'll say it real loud. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Amen? Please don't make me get off this stage so early. I'm going to preach this morning. I'm going to let God use me this morning. Hallelujah. But I know for a fact that you and I as believers, we're going through some things in our lives. And sometimes all we need is just a little pinch. My mama used to walk behind me and pinch me. And then my mama realized that that little tiny pinch didn't work anymore, so she got one of those little souvenir baseball bats. And then my mama graduated to a cast iron frying pan. Because how many know we start off as babies, the good old sinners as babies, and then we grow up to little toddlers, and they call that the terrible two generation. Now it's the t- terrible 22's generation, amen? But the, t- the terrible twos, then you grow up to be an adolescent, and then all of a sudden you're a teenager, and all of a sudden you know everything there is to know about everything in the world. Amen? I mean, I know you guys don't live like that, but I did when I was a kid. So my mom had to graduate from the pinch to the belt, from the belt to the stick, from the stick over to the cast iron frying pan, amen? And I am proud to stand here before you and tell you that the frying pan, it worked marvelous wonders. I'm not talking about a little egg frying cast iron pan. I'm talking about the Mexican version, the one that you heat your tortillas on, the big one, the heavy one that you can't hardly hold with one hand. Some of you Mexicanas, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have one at home, and you've probably used it on your children at times. I see your heads nodding up and down, and I'm not looking at you. I promise you, I'm not going to get into that one. But the frying pan, it worked for me because I was one of those kids that that did not learn by reading a book. I was not one that learned by, by just trying something. No, I had to be involved in it, and I had to be dealt with. And that's exactly the way I live my life today for God. I cannot just walk through life believing a certain way. I cannot just walk through life thinking that God's going to do everything wonderful for me because I am smart enough to know that the world is like the frying pan. Amen? It'll either make you or it'll break you. Hallelujah. And the frying pan that I walked into, it saved my life. Glory to God. You see, the world today, we got a couple of things that we, uh, there's, couple powerful spiritual forces that war against you and I as a believer and one of them is the world it's the spirit of the age that we live in today how many know that the world is a, is a real thing it's 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 it, things are going on around us that we don't even understand and even when you hear about it and it's explained to us you're like I can't believe that's even there sometimes my wife asks me do you mean that exists are you serious that really happens number two is our flesh that's from fallen nature you know, we walk into things and we're so easily tempted. You know, the devil, he'll just cast out a little, a little treat out in front of you and then he'll, he'll just pull it in like this, you know. Almost not quite as bad as fly fishing because then you see it. But I'm talking about where it's just pulled in real slow. And that's how the devil will do He'll say, well, I'm just going to cast it out there and I'm just going to see exactly what it's going to do. You know, I like the attitude that's a little bit different. Pastor Paul him and I, we grew up together as little boys, and he was telling me a story the other day. And it was so funny because as he was telling me the story, I said to him, you know what? You've always said this. Even when, you were, when we were little boys, you said this to me. And one of the things, that, the, the, what, it, what it was, what he was saying was when he took his granddaughter, his daughter fishing for the first time, he said, I used to tell her that when I casted my line in, that that's the right spot. That's what he would say to her. That's the right spot. See, many times in our lives, we think we're in the wrong spot. But you know what? God wants us to know we are in the right spot. And one day his daughter asked him, well, Dad, you you told me that that was the right spot. He goes, no, 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 now this is the right spot. And I just thought it was kind of funny because I remembered him saying that even to me when we were little boys running in the streets like little hellions. Amen? But that's the right spot. You know, the world will put you in places where you don't even know you're going. You, before you know it, you'll wake up and you'll be in a pond somewhere just completely blown away. How did I get here? What happened to me? What's going on in my life? And it's because the world has its way to destroy our flesh. And number three is the devil. How many know that the devil is the, is the instigator of evil? Oh, everything could be wonderful. Things could be great. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man, you could be at the top of the world making good money. You could be doing good things, driving a nice car. And then all of the sudden, the devil will bring a luring spirit. Something will happen. Something goes on in your life. And all of a sudden, his tricks begin to work in your life and cause you to go off into the world. You say, that would never happen to me. What's well, amazing how it does happen. You get a phone call, someone you haven't talked to in 20 years. They say, hey, how you doing? 
Oh my goodness, man, it's good to hear from you. That's great. How are you doing? Yeah, it's wonderful. Hey, man, we're having a get together over here, me and a couple guys that we used to go to school with, and we're all going to just get together, man. We'd like to invite you. Come on out, be with us. In your mind at that very moment, you're thinking to yourself, hmm, this is not going to be good for me. But inside you say, well, I want a little bit of the world. I want, to be, I want to be a part. You know, I'm a Christian. I can go show my love to these people. I can be a part of what they're doing. And I can inter- intermingle and I can, I can get in there and get involved. And, and you never know. God may just use me to minister to them. And all of a sudden the mind begins to, st- begins to play tricks. See, this is what the devil does. His strategy, his plan to destroy. It's a schematic that's set up uh, to destroy our lives. And all of a sudden we, we know what's right, but we don't do what's right. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that's me. That's the way I used to be when I wasn't saved. And sometimes, even being saved, I catch myself going places or doing things that I probably shouldn't do in business. Sometimes you say things to people. I'm I'm dealing with people all day long, and there's sometimes I'll catch myself before before I say a little tiny white lie. And I'll catch myself and say, no, that is not right. Don't say that. Just say it. And I've had to learn the hard way that you just say it and let right be right. Let God bless you because, listen, God's going to bless you. God's going to pour His Spirit. But the moment that you give in to that little tiny piece of temptation just to make things better for yourself, that's when the devil says, ha-ha, I got you. That's when the devil says, ho-ho, I got that old boy right in my front pocket. That means any time I get out in in, in this place with him and I need somebody, I know who I can go to. Oh, I know that I can just go over here, and this one's going to slip in this area. And this one over here, he's going to slip in this area. That one's going to slip over here and this and that. You know, the devil knows. Have you ever seen him work in your life that way? Where all of a sudden things can be good, and then boom, all of a sudden you're going down the wrong path. You don't even know what's happened. I used to do it. My wife used to torment me. We got married back uh, a long time ago. I remember, baby, don't do that to me. You know how my brain is. It works a little bit slow sometimes, okay? We got married in 1990. Okay? In 94, we started dating. No, we got married in 94. Am I right? Baby, I'm testing you to see if you know. I want to know if you know. Is I want you to say these numbers out as I'm saying. If you don't know, it's okay. I'll, we'll talk later, okay? We got married in 1994. Huh? Yes, I know my anniversary too, but let's get on with this. <laughs> Here we are. Man, you made me forget my story. What was I saying? Lord have mercy. Yeah, that wasn't it though. <laughs> my, my, my. Let me get back to my notes over here. See what happens when you start having fun? Amen. I know I was talking about when we started a date and we got married, but I don't remember the rest of the story. Hallelujah. I guess it's not important. Lord, if you wanted me to say it, bring it back to me later. Hallelujah. Amen. So anyways, let's go on with the message here. God bless you. Well, praise God. So many are living in a bondage. Many people are living in this bondage of habits and mindsets and fears and things that are going on in their life. They're bound by these things, and they have no control over these things, and and they're living under this bondage. Anxieties. A demonic activity which shames them or torments them because of things that, or maybe it controls your life because of what you've been a part of in your life at one time. You know, you can't, uh, you, 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 there's nothing you can do about what you've done. And that's, that's where I was going with this story. I'll finish it. So there was a time when we first got married where I didn't want to go to church. I really didn't want to go as much as, you know, I went and I, I just did my thing. And I went to church. I was rebellious as, as all get out, like some people that come to church today. And I sat in the back of the church with chewing tobacco on my lip. I'm not telling you this this morning because I'm proud of it. I'm telling you this because I'm ashamed of it and I see what God has brought me through. And I sat in the very, very, very back row back there, and I would chew tobacco all over my teeth. I didn't care what her dad said, what anybody said. I didn't care because I was so rebellious, and I was going to live my life the way that I lived my life. And that little tiny vice that I had in my life, it was just an open door for the devil to work in me. And I gave him that authority in my life by saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, I know nobody in this place says they're going to do what they want to do, and you just do it. But I was that person. 
And I said, oh, I'm not going to, the, to, I'm not going to church. And then I'd be on, there, on the TV watching the Bronco games. And I'm a diehard Bronco fan. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching. And the moment the door would shut, I would jump up. And I'm up there in, the, in my recliner. I got the, the cheese dip and the chips and all the good stuff out. And I'm having a good old time while she's at church. But down in my spirit, I'm vexed because I know I should not be doing that. But I already gave the devil a, a little tiny piece of my life to, to, to get in. So little did I know, time goes by. You know, I'm a Bronco fan, so I, I can't stand the Kansas City Chiefs, and I can't stand the Raiders, and I can't stand, you know, all of our rivalry teams, just like you guys can't stand the Washington team. You can't stand Philadelphia. You know, it's a rivalry between your teams. And, and, but now, guess what? My wife is a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Because every time she'd see me watching that game, she would say, I hate I hate the Broncos. I hope they lose. And she would do it to vex me. And I would say, oh, God, you're going to have to help me. And God says, you can't even help yourself. How am I going to help you? And every time I'd be there, I'd be excited watching the game. That's why now you know me. I can't even go with you to watch a game because I get so nervous and excited. And I'm so passionate about my team. But I'm afraid my wife's going to walk in or somebody's going to walk in and say, like Linda Polk, I don't know where she's at, but, you know, she loves the Patriots. She's not a bandwagon Patriots fan either, by the way. Juan. But I can't be there when somebody's saying, yeah, go Patriots. I can't do it. But this one here, you know what she does? I hate the Broncos. You know why? Because it takes her back to that place in our marriage where I was a failure. It takes her back into that place, always reminds her, when I'm watching that ball game, she used to walk by, who's playing, the Broncos? She don't care about what's on that TV. I can't even get her to look at it. Baby, come on over here. It's so romantic. If we watch this game together, <laughs> nothing. Baby, please, come on, watch this game. Nope, I hate the Broncos. And for the rest of her life, she's probably going to hate the Broncos because it takes her back to that place in my life where I was an absolute I'm just going to say I was a loser to myself. I'm not saying if you're battling something that you're a loser today. I'm just saying when you know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, there's a conviction, there's a hurt, there's a pain that comes along with that. And it took me many years to realize, and now I just respect the fact that if I'm going to watch a football game, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to really stay quiet about it. I'm going to stay quiet. I'm not going to go to your house and hang out. Uh, you notice me. I, I don't, if you ever say anything about a football game, I'll tell you, hey, don't tell me the score. I got it recorded. I'm still on last week's games. I haven't even watched them. I'm still learning. I'm still watching because that's just how I am. But when you give the devil an inch, he will begin to take over your life. He'll begin to destroy you. You see, many of God's people, they're blinded to the fact uh, that they are to, that they're, they're being controlled. They're blinded to the fact uh, that they have authority in their life over the spiritual matters. They don't realize that, yes, the devil can come at you. The devil's plan can hit you. But they're supposed to be in control of the situation. Too few realize that they can take dominion over the situation in life and they can possess their land in peace and blessing. How many know that? You can have that power. You can have uh, the peace of God and his blessing, the prosperity of God over your life. Hallelujah. I'm not talking about just going laying hands on cars and saying this is my car. Because how many know the Bible says you got to work for something if you want it? Amen? It says if you don't work, you're, you're pretty lazy. And I, I think we ought to be working. Amen? You see, they don't have to live in bondage. And in today's easy believism world, we see all kinds of things go on. They often neglect the truth of contending for the conquest won at victory. You see, we need to understand this morning that God is doing something in our lives. You know, you might feel like you're at a roadblock in your life. You might feel like you're hitting a brick wall. But you need to know that God is doing something. He's doing something powerful, and, and our, our, our will needs to be broke. Our understanding needs to be, be, be helped and dealt with. So we are distressed when victory doesn't just come and fall in our laps. When it doesn't happen our way, uh, we give up and we just fall apart. It's like, oh, my gosh, everything's over now. There's no hope for me. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm worthless. 
It took many days of me praying and many days of me seeking the, the, the answers from God. Uh, Lord, what is it you have for me? How can I change? How can I be, Lord, who you want me to be? Not the old grouchy cuss that I used to be. Think I was this and think I was that. Uh, you know, I was never home. I, I worked probably from 6.30 in the morning and I left and I didn't get home until 8, 9 o'clock at night. And I would tell her, I'm going to work hard for my family. I didn't have anything as a kid. I was poor. I, all the excuses that we all use. I've never had this. I never had that. We never owned a house. We never drove nice cars. We never this. We never that. You know what? None of that stuff even matters. Absolutely none of that stuff even matters. What I wanted to know is, God, what is it that you could do in me to make me who you want me to be? But I didn't realize that he had already made me that way. I didn't realize that it, it had already been spoken over me in my life and, and that it was there for me and all I had to do was reach out for it. Victory was mine, saith the Lord. Amen? So too many people, too few people realize that. See, wars must be fought for victory to be won. If you don't fight the war, there can't be any victory in your life. Wars are not won by talking, but by fighting. You don't show up uh, to the gates of hell with a water gun. You don't show up to a gunfight with a pair of scissors. It just doesn't work that way, man. I met a guy, I seen a guy one time, he's six foot eight. He said, you know what? He said, I don't even walk the streets of L.A. with my jewelry on. You know, these guys wear, some of these guys wear big necklaces. I'm telling you what, my body would be like this if I was wearing them things. He says, I'm six foot eight, and I was a bodyguard. I was a bad dude. He says, I'm still a bad dude. I'm kind of crazy, he says. He says, but I don't even walk in downtown L.A. right now with my jewelry on because all I'm doing is giving somebody an opportunity to come take it from me. And in this world, in today's generation, they don't care. They'll take your life and then take your jewelry. You know, when we lived in Costa Rica, it was dangerous. You walk down the street, we had to be careful. And we made a pact with our community that we were in in Palos where, where we pastored that church. And, and one of the things that all the ladrones, they call them the thieves, were, they would ask our, anybody walking down the street, are, they say, well, I'm coming from church. And the thieves would ask them, what church do you go to? Because I went in the city and I went and talked to all those thieves and I said, listen, it's not right that you're stealing from these people from the church. These people love the Lord. They're giving all they got and they're coming to service. Uh, and I said, I need you to leave them alone. I went straight to their houses. I went, well, you can ask my wife and my kids. We went to their homes. We went to where they were, where their gangs hung out. And I stood in front of them and I said, you leave our people alone. I said, God will get you. And you know, they respected us. They would ask every person before they robbed them after our church services, what church do you go to? And they would say, Ministerios de Victoria, hallelujah. And they would just walk with power and authority. You see, that's what I'm trying to tell you today, is we have the power, we have the authority to walk past the enemy, glory to God, and to tell the enemy where to go. I remember one Saturday afternoon, we were doing an outreach, and I took off one direction, and, and the rest of the team was another way, and I went, and when I pulled into this neighborhood, it was me and Landon in the car, and I'm telling you what, they took off like cockroaches. There's about 50 people in this community, and they were all back in this back area. It was like a, a roundabout area, and we pulled up in there, and I'm telling you what, they took off running like crazy, and I didn't know what was going on, but I told Landon, I said, it's something serious. And we were just going to visit a family that hadn't been to church for very long, uh, in a long time. We went and visited. I said, I just want to say hi to them and just let them know we want to see them. I invited them to church, and she said, you don't even want to know what you just did. And I said, no, you're probably right. I don't want to know. They said, we have three drug lords in this community. And the three drug lords finally came together. They finally came together, and they started working together, and they started having these meetings and you just pulled up in the middle of one of their meetings hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of drugs that just scattered all over the place when they took off they saw me coming they respected the man of God so much that they could not do what they were doing in front of us now that has nothing to do with me I'm just a little peon I'm nobody but I'm doing what God's called me to do and when you do what God's calling you to do, God will disrupt anything that the devil is doing around you. God will disrupt it. He will get in the middle of it, and God will, uh, he will he'll completely close it down. Very next day at church, uh, one of these gentlemen walks into the church, and he walks down the aisle. He says, hey, I want to give my tithe to the church. I said, no, I'm, I'm not taking this dirty money. We don't, th this isn't the kind of church we are. You're not bringing it. He says, well, the, the pastor down the street takes my tithe all the time. I says, well, you might, have, might as well just take it back to him. But this church right here, we're not taking drug money. 
I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to live with that on my conscience. I'm not going to do it. He said, last night, I want you to know what you did. When you drove into that neighborhood, right, right then, everything turned. And got, he got mad. He got upset. He says, when you pulled into that neighborhood and you drove in there last night, he said, we lost the biggest drug deal that we've ever done in our entire life. He said, people lose their lives for that. He says, but there's something about you that is different. He says, you're not afraid. He says, what is it about you? I said, I've got Jesus, uh, and he's alive in my spirit. Hallelujah. I said, God, is he's alive in me. You say, well, you're not afraid. Yes, we're scared to death. We went in them places shaking. I had a guy one time on outreach. He, I said, man, I want to tell you about my God. He's awesome. And I pulled out a track, handed it to him. He lifted up his shirt. He says, well, I'm going to tell you about my God. You better get out of here. And he's got the 9 millimeter pistol stuck in his pants right here. I mean, you got a decision to make in the very moment. I mean, you could take off running like I wanted to. I wanted to run off like a little girl screaming. Ah! But they'll shoot you in the back just as well as they'll shoot you in your stomach. And I stood there before that man, and it turned out that that man got saved. Carla, you know who he is. His name was Corlas. He was, he was one of the biggest gangsters in that whole city. We actually saw him die right in front of our church. We saw another gang come and kill him. But you know what God did? God orchestrated a team. He orchestrated a place where Pastor Blake and Carla started this church. Man, when they took that church, it was just a brick building with no, really no floors and no ceilings at all. It took a vision to go into that place. But it wasn't a vision of, you know, Pastor Blake didn't see that building. I'm sure Carla was thinking, oh, my goodness, what are you thinking? What in the world is in your mind? You, you want to build a baptismal tank in the pulpit? I mean, it was a concrete floor. It was just like this with tile on it. And Pastor Blake had a vision of building an entire pulpit just like this. But guess what? You can't buy wood like this in Costa Rica. It costs too much money. So they built it out of concrete and dirt. One day he has these big dump trucks. Well, they didn't have a roof on the building. So glory to God, we'll just drive these big semis in and dump the dirt in the building. And it's like you and I. Here we go. Everybody brings their shovel from the house. We're, everybody's digging, digging dirt. You remember it like it was yesterday, probably. The girls probably remember it. They were little at the time, but you remember it. You were working. And I'm telling you something, the vision became alive. And little did we know, filling that place with dirt, putting brick around it and filling it in with dirt and building a baptism. How many people were going to get saved in that best baptismal tank? That baptismal tank, we had to fill it up while we were baptizing people. It was leaking so bad. But you know what? It wasn't for our flesh. It wasn't for us to feel good. It was because of what God was about to do in that community. Hallelujah. Little did we know that all of that investment was for us to come in there and pastor that church and see all the souls that God was going to save. And now we look back and look, pastor's there now. He's, it, it, next week he'll be in that church preaching, the church where God used him to build it. I'm telling you what, God's a miracle working God. Now, does that mean that we've never had any obstacles on the way? Absolutely not. We've had people uh, killed right in front of our church. I was standing in the parking lot one day, and a guy walks in. He says, give me, your, give me your phone to the guy I was talking to. I was counseling a guy in the church right in the parking lot. And I'm standing in there, and a guy walks in from the gate, and he pulls out his gun. And he, says, he said, give me your cell phone. And the guy I was talking to said, no. I said, you might want to give me your cell phone. He said, I'm not giving it to him. He said, I'll, the, guy, the guy with the gun says, I'll shoot your hand off, and I'll take your gun. He says, then shoot my hand off. The guy said, okay, boom, shot his hand off right in front of me. And I'm talking right in front of me, right here. We're standing in a little circle. People, kids all out in the parking lot having fun, talking. People coming into the church. We're about to start in five minutes. You can imagine. The guy turns around and walks off and takes the phone, just goes, hits it down. And the guy says, Pastor, I'm so sorry, but I can't be in church tonight. I got to go get my hand taken care of. I was like, Okay. Go get your hand taken care of. But do you understand what I'm saying? You could be doing all the right things, and all of a sudden the challenge comes against you. You could be serving God, and the devil's strategy, his plan, will come against your life. And, and, and it just, you know, we got to understand that the victory doesn't just come in our lives. Or, or confronted with difficulties and struggles within, our, within ourselves. See, wars must be fought to, for these victories to be won in our lives. we got to know that today. That God's promise says if we obey and trust God, that He will prevail. That's what His Word says. So then we got to confronting the enemy. How many times do we let the enemy get by with something in our lives? The fact of life is, life is a spiritual conflict. No one likes conflict in their life, Amen. No one likes to go through hard times, but, but, but it is important that we understand this relationship. Because if we ignore it, uh, 
it will not make anything go away. If you ignore it, your problems won't disappear. Peace is something that's often purchased at a price. There's always going to be those who will take your property from you. There's always those who will take your liberty from you or remove us from our heritage or our inheritance. How many know a bully in your life? How many has ever known somebody that's tried to destroy your character by being a bully or an aggressor? Let me tell you something. The devil does not let up. It doesn't matter how saved you are in this place. It doesn't matter how well you're doing right now. The devil, he will never give up and just let you be who you want to be. Listen, he must be confronted. The devil must be confronted. Spiritual and fleshly problems do not just go away. It doesn't happen like that. Only to be confronted with others. But but listen, but the Lord was armed with the word of God when he was in that place of of being tempted. How many know when Jesus was in the wilderness, he was tempted? And we know the story about Jesus being tempted. And, and, but here's the thing. He got victory over the temptation. And what happened? Another temptation came right after. Another one came right after. Sometimes we give up after the first temptation. And we leave and we, we're gone for two, three months. We don't want to talk to anybody. Because it affects us so bad. It destroys our character. It destroys who we are. Number three, a surpassing victory. The scripture we read this morning says we're more than conquerors. That means victory. Victory over the world. Victory over flesh. And victory over the devil. Do you have victory over the devil this morning? You might have victory over the devil. Do you have victory over your flesh? These are all very important things. See, God has already placed the strength to conquer in every one of us, as I mentioned earlier. He birthed us this way. He gave us this, this gift when, when we were born, when he created this. This is why he sent the children of Israel into Canaan. He knew exactly what would happen, that they would win. You see, whatever it is you're going through today, whatever trial you're going through, whatever God is allowing you to go through in your life today, just know that you're going to win the battle. But you have to fight for it. You have to rise up against the enemy and take authority over that situation in your life. And we're going to have an altar call in just a moment, so bear with me. I'm going to close. I promise to go quick, okay? So God has already placed the strength to conquer in every one of us. And I want you you to know something. Watch out for the I can't generation. I can't do this. I can't overcome. I can't can't believe that. I can't do that. I can't. I can't. I can't. Do you ever hear somebody? It's always I can't. Oh, there's no way I could do that. I'm, I'm not worthy of that. I'm not able to do that. You know, God said that you are somebody special. He says you are his creation. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we need to know that it's more than just joining any type of a club or any type of a a religious atmosphere, whatever the case might be, but it is a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we have that intimate relationship with him, no matter what we go through, we call upon his name. Too many times we take no for an answer. My oldest son, Landon, he's not here. He's in Costa Rica with Pastor right now. I remember when he was a baby, we went to, we were season ticket holders to the Broncos, and we took him to a game. And one of our dreams, we always wanted Shannon Sharp to hold him. Shannon Sharp was one of our favorite players. Just loved his big rippling muscles. You know, that's why I'm always tormenting Gino. He kind of reminds me of Shannon Sharp. One time, I said, I want Shannon Sharp to hold him. And I knew a few people on the team and a couple things, and I was trying to pull my my weight. And I walked up to Shannon Sharp. I seen him come out. We waited to the very end, and all the players are coming out, going out to their cars. And I said, there he is. I'll ask him. And he's got his entourage of bodyguards all around him, probably 15 people around him. And they're walking out. He's just showered up. He's all cleaned up, coming out. And I said, Shannon, I says, will you hold my son? Let me get a picture. Kept walking. I thought, let me try this again. Hey, Shannon. Shannon Sharp. You met me at John Elway's office a couple weeks ago. Remember me? Kept walking. So my wife says, give me Landon. And she grabs him from me. And she runs up to him. Runs to the people. They're, I mean, they're like looking at her like, this is crazy. This woman's crazy. And they were right. Because she didn't do anything but throw Landon from here to there. 
And Shannon Sharp had no choice but to catch my son. I know what you're thinking. Landon's so hard-headed. That's, he, he fell and hit his head on the ground. No. She found a way for Shannon Sharp to hold that baby. It's not a big deal. It's really nothing. I, I can care less about fame and fortune. I can care less about any of that stuff. But you know that I learned a valuable lesson? I'm nobody. I am nobody. Even though I was at the Denver Bronco Arizona Cardinal game, and Linda's not here this morning. Her, she's got a real close connection to the Arizona Cardinals, but I was at the game and season ticket holder there, and I'm sitting there with my boys, and I said, watch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yell out a name that John Elway's only going to recognize because I know him. And it made me feel so good because I yelled out, hey, Johnny boy. And I was sitting five, six rows back behind where he comes out of that visitor tunnel. And he looks up at me and he looks at me and he waves. He goes like this to me with his finger. You know, and for us in sports, we're like, "Woo, yeah, he knows me. But who am I? Who am I? I'm nobody. And sometimes if you want to get somewhere in life, you got to be a little bit aggressive. Sometimes when that bottle has you taken over, Kristen, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I, I promise, only three more hours, I, I promise. When that bottle has you, <laughs> there comes a time when you have to say, you know what, bottle, no more. And you got to break it. You got to make a fool of yourself. Throw it in the trash. You got to do something about it. You got to walk away from it. And you got to talk to it. And you got to say, you're going to stay there. You have no power over me. You're not going to win this battle because I am a child of God. You know, a lot of men say, oh, I'm in charge of my family. I'm the head of the house. We are. You're 100% correct. You are. But you know, we would. It would help you a lot if you just listen to your wife sometimes. She has taught me more lessons in life than I think any man could have ever taught me. And I'm, I mean that from my heart. I know I joke a lot. But I really mean that. Because I was one of these hard-headed men that needed the frying pan to learn a lesson. And there's a lot of you hard-headed men in this place who need the same lesson that I've received. And I think we've all kind of received it. But when my wife speaks wisdom into my life, you know what I do? I listen. Because I've sat back and watched the fruit. The Bible says we're known by our fruits. If there's no live fruit in your life, then you got to reconsider. What am I doing? God, what can you do in me? A simple throw the baby five feet into somebody's arms. My goodness, what a revelation. Why did I not ever think of that? And today we have a picture of Shannon Sharp holding Landon with his big old, of course, you can only imagine with my big arm. I'm just kidding. Shannon Sharp sitting there as big as he could be, and we just loved it. But you know what? We get to tell this testimony every, everywhere we go about the goodness of God. God will give you the desires of your heart. It's not about the Sports Center highlight. It's not about being the greatest person you could ever be, but it's, God, how can you use me? Have, if I could have every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. This morning, I know I went just a little bit long, and I, I promise I'm going to get better. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. You know, Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, and if you'll just believe that scripture and live right for God, it will blow your mind. You see, because the moment that you and I are born into God's kingdom, we need to know that heaven's strength resides in us. It resides in us. And today, God has a very special purpose and plan for all of us here today. He knows exactly who you are, what you are, and what you're going through. It feels so good at times to be special to somebody, to be known or recognized by somebody. Those are all wonderful things. You go through life and you meet very important people. But there's no person more important than God. Jesus. The Spirit of God that comes into our church services. That makes himself so real to us in this place. And we're here today with an opportunity to surrender to God. 
And I want to give you that opportunity this morning. You're here today. You're not saved. You say, Pastor, I'm away from God. I'm not living for him today. But I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand up, put it up, and put it right back down as high as you can. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Just put it up and put it back down. I want to pray for you. How many all over this place, from left to right, front to back, just put it up and put it right back down. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. You said, Pastor, I've been struggling with some things in my life. I'm going through a difficult time. I'm, I'm a little bit hard-headed. I, I, I've, I've been through that school of hard knocks that you're talking about, and I really need God to help me. I need a miracle in my life. If that's you, I want you just to put your hand up, put it, put it up, put it right back down. See, I see myself going in the right direction. Amen. I see these hands. Let's all stand up to our feet this morning if we would. In reverence to the Lord, we're going we're gonna to pray. And I want to ask you to come down to these altars this morning. Just spend a few minutes with God. and We're going to worship. Kristen's going to play a song. We're going to worship God. And I want you to lift your hands up to him and worship him. Open your heart to God. Give him the desires of your heart. Tell him, God, this is who I am. He knows already, but tell him. And say, Lord, what can you do with me? How can you use me? Let's pray. Let's come forward this morning. I'm desperate for you. 